disturbing movie. <laughs> I mean, disturbing. Yeah. Really disturbing. They're old men. They gotta go to the bathroom. I'm in a, I'm sort of in a state of shock. Oh, just before oh, we, God. just before we get started, let me tell you two things about the film that you may not know. First, when it opened in 1964, it was not well reviewed and it was considered a failure. Over the years, its reputation has grown and grown. And now it's considered one of Hitchcock's greatest achievements. Oh, I don't know. So it's had complete. I don't know. I heard it myself. I don't know. Yeah. And I don't know. Second, his original choice for the lead was Grace Kelly. But and Grace Kelly wanted to do it. She wanted to make a comeback, but it was considered not proper for the prince. Princess of Monaco to appear in movies and especially not to play a thief. <laughs> so it was not, she, she desperately wanted to come back and do this. Foster, I was in Paris at the exhibition that Grace's son gave, put on, and I saw the letter that she wrote Hitch about the film, turning it down. She wanted to do it. You know that for sure. Yes. She wanted to do it. Okay, it was I not, take your word it for it. Not, it was not considered protocol. Her mm -hmm. husband said this isn't proper. Mm -hmm. Not proper. You know, it's something that Hitchcock wanted to do for years. So critics of Hitchcock say this film cuts close to the bone with the master himself, that there's mm -hmm. something in this story that comes from deep within him. I. It has to be something deep in somebody. Because, uh, <laughs> there's got to be a reason that one makes this kind of film. It is very disturbing and, um, and, and, and in some ways destructive. But it is, I guess, the, the therapist dream <laughs> to be able to get a hold of someone like this and to be able to get them to face the it, what happened. And it's okay. It is about facing your your the, the demons and the but the it is, horror. It is yeah. about a man. It's about a man mm -hmm. who gets control of a woman and cures Absolutely. her. Absolutely, and cures her. Oh now that leads to the main question of of his life. your relationship to Hitchcock. Diane Baker is one of the few surviving people who can tell us firsthand. What it was like to be directed by this no, great. No, I, I feel like director. I feel like crying right now. Really. You do? Yeah. Because you, it, it's so many years ago, and uh, I don't, you know, how you get through that. How you go through that kind of experience. It was a couple of months of working. At, it was very destructive. Very you? destructive. Yeah. I have never let this happen to me in front of people. I really am. But see, and at my age, I don't know. I don't know. Can you tell it us? It was destructive, Foster. Can you tell us? Well, it? it was destructive for to me. It was destructive for me. I never was sick and couldn't come to work one day. I had the doctor come to my own. I did not want to go back to the set. I did not want to work under that tension. You know, we were pushed to to, um, to show up and do your work, and Hitch, Hitch was manipulative. He manipulated us, and um, I saw what he did to Debbie. I never saw them have a civil word, and I never believed that working in an industry would be like this. Uh, years later, I was at a meeting at the SAG, at the Directors Guild, and there was it was a harassment meeting, and I was listening to people talking about uh, harassment in the workplace, and I suddenly thought, oh my God, is that what happened to me and to us on the film? It was it was it was manipulation. And it was harassment in, a, in its form, but it was psychiatric harassment, psycho psychological harassment. 
He was, he was very um, strange, to put it mildly, very difficult, strange. And uh, you never knew day to day what he was going to be like with, I didn't know how, you know, he'd, he'd come up and tell stories. Um, yeah, I'm, now I'm thinking about it, it's kind of coming up in me. Maybe I shouldn't have seen this film tonight. But then look. Because I wouldn't have come in nearly tears like this. But then look what we're learning. No, but we're learning only I'm learning, I think, no more. I don't know about anybody else what you learn from my experience, but because it's really just a, an experience I had on the film. I mean, I'm, my dear Millie, your sister, your daughter, your mother, your daughter, your sister. <laughs> I mean, she had her experiences on diary with people. Um, and we've shared a lot lately, by the way, Lily. We talk about things that have happened that I haven't said to people. And she's telling me things about her life that she hasn't said to people. And it's kind of wonderful to go back over your life and say, oh my god, this happened, this happened, and not be afraid. But Diane, can you make a separation between the man Hitchcock, who was a yes, yes, I know what you're going and, to say. And he was an artist because we've just seen a great film. He was film. a great. He was an artist, but that doesn't mean that all artists are good people, <laughs> or kind people, or loving people. It does not mean that. It means they're great artists, and you just said it. You have to make a distinction between the artist, and you don't have to like the person. I didn't go to his memorial service because I didn't like him. I did not like him. He was not a good person. And would he, he was be not brought, a kind person. Would he be brought up on charges now in the Me Too movement? Well, considering what Tippy went through and what I went through, yes. He wouldn't get away with it. Now. No. No. Would you speak out now? Well, I mean, it. Yes, I suppose I would, but I'm too old to deal with all that today. I don't want to go through all the Michigas, the, the stuff that it takes to, to deal with it. Yeah, but, but I mean, I feel sorry now for, for people in the end. I feel sorry for anyone who has to, uh, you know, he kept me till the last day. I always said uh, I had to be in Israel to do a movie. And I was supposed to be in rehearsal, and because I said things out to him, I said spoke, and I, I had I rejected him, to be honest, and um, he kept me till the last day, perversely, because he was angry, and I, I, I just angry, but he didn't speak to Tippy the whole time, the movie. Did not speak to her. Oh no, I never saw him talk to her except a director on the set when we were shooting. And then he talks to me all the time in front of her and tries to make me feel like I'm the next mom that's going to work but for him. I would have none of it finally. I saw, I began to feel this itchy, kind of upsetting feeling of being a tension. And I didn't know, I'm on a film, I'm a professional. Totally professional, I truly, you know. Uh, can you look at the film and see that you and Tippi are giving terrific performances in difficult parts? Yeah, I didn't know what I was doing, actually. Tell you the truth, I didn't really know. Uh, uh, I, I didn't really, I just took, I just followed what I was, felt was the right thing to do. And to, you know, I loved the man. By the way, I have to say, wasn't he the most incredibly handsome, brilliant actor? I mean, he has seen dialogue, well to well dialogue throughout the piece. He was not only the therapist, he was the lover, he was the, uh, he was everything. I mean, masculine, talk about just being a man, totally. Um, you know, I mean. Your light shot. Oh, oh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, he was also, um, he grabbed me behind the scenes one day um, and took my arm and held it and said, oh, I said, Sean, don't be hurting my arm. And he said, oh, Diane, my, then he was living with um, the actress in England and he says, she loves to be, she loves this. And I said, well, I don't. <laughs> to, to, to 
cry out to hurt, be hurt. I don't know. Was, was, was Hitchcock him? different to him as a as he a didn't male talk? Or? He didn't really. Uh, um, he didn't really. They talked civilly. There was a, but I didn't feel that that Hitch was uh, had camaraderie with almost anyone in the film that, that was in the film. In fact, I came. I was on the set watching the shooting because uh, we had to be there. And uh, one day he said to an actor, uh, he was uh, fell asleep in the chair while he's shooting a scene. Yeah. Fell sound asleep, and the assistant director had to say, "Hitch, cut." He said, "Cut," and he uh, suddenly woke up and he said, "Cut." Uh, but he didn't. He fell sound asleep while he was shooting a scene with somebody. I've never in my life seen that happen on the set. Because, you know, she drank he's... too much at lunch. She drank a lot of red wine. I was invited to lunch several times. I went, but it was not comfortable. I didn't drink, didn't care, any of that stuff. But you know, he pre-planned every shot oh, but before he went to the set. Brilliant. I came, was invited to the screening room uh, to watch the sequences as they were drawn. He drew everything. He drew everything. I had them drawn by somebody. And, and I saw myself on a horse, sitting with a hat and with a drawing. And then when they filmed the scenes, and the film, film, the scenes were filmed, then he would insert them into the picture as the editor started getting, accumulating the material. So then they would be... Uh, but he knew before he, he got on the set. He, he knew exactly everything. every angle, he knew every, angle. every shot. Did he every... direct you as an actor at all? No, he came up and moved my hair at the window and doing all these little things, you know, to touch. And that's how close at moments... But he didn't talk about the psychology of your character? No, no he and never, the ever, 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 the ever mentioned just, you know, you're, you're jealous. I knew that I had to be jealous, and I had to be the. I was. I knew I was the bad girl, and therefore I had to. You know, I, I was the one to give her away. That was. And but yet, who would believe that a man would be truly in love with somebody who was so? He was as bad as she said about. He was as bad as she is. Two of them were. Uh, Two peas in a pod. Yeah, they're reflections of each other. I mean, you know, I, I'm the third wheel in a funny, I mean, I, I was around conveniently there to kind of show the, uh, if I hadn't been there, there'd have been no dynamic actually in the film because there had to be somebody placed in the spot where I wanted him, I wanted, I really expected to have him. It was given a natural thing that I would be the, the, the lady of the house, and tried to act as if I was by owning the house, by moving freely and being in the house and knowing every little corner and every uh, part of it. Um, but you, you provided this psychology for yourself. Oh, I had to, of course. It didn't come from the director. No, no, no. Did I, you I, like yeah. the character? No, no. <laughs> she was a, 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 you know, I don't, you don't have to like the character particularly, you just have to make that character believable. I didn't like the big part that I played last night in straight tracking. But, you know, let me say this. I've taken roles in films that I didn't like. I wanted to be a working actress. I was felt, felt lucky to be given parts. Um, but I decided when I produced, I said I get a chance to pick my own material after being given these parts. I was asked to do a Roger Corman movie that happened to be about a piranha. And I turned it down and I threw it in the garbage and it felt so good <laughs> in the 1970s to throw a script in the garbage and watch it just land in the trash. And uh, even the director, the, my agent kept going, calling me up and offering me more money that they wanted me to do it so much. And I said, don't you get it? It's now not about money. And that's the day I decided I'm going to write, um, start working on projects that I want to produce. And I made a commitment to myself, always to produce something that I wanted to do, that I admired the qualities of it, that had something good to say. 
and to, to work, at, whether it was medicine, which I did, a documentary was nominated for an Emmy on miracles in the making. It was about alternative medicine and meeting Norman Cousins, who was the Saturday Review editor, and all the good he did in the, bringing the maidens back from Japan and doing reconstructive surgery. I love Norman Cousins, and I got to know him very well. So I concentrated my, my work on positives. And then doing To Climb a Mountain, which was also given rewards with HBO. Uh, and it had about 11 handicapped climbers from Mount Rainier. And they were all handicapped, and they got to make it to the top. And I wanted to see people do something worthy. So I continued, and that's what I, why I made these movies. I love Martin Scorsese's brilliant filmmaking. But even The Irishman, gratuitous violence for no reason doesn't make sense. It only propagates and pushes it further into our society. And it's shocking why we accept it. Why? But, but let me go back to the Hitchcock. When you got this is there, psychologically heartbreaking, actually, to think. When you got to the Hitchcock part, I was you excited? Yes. Oh, yeah, I didn't read a script it. before I got to you take this. No, he thrilled. never. I was thrilled. It was Hitchcock. And, and North by Northwest. And um, you know the writer of North by Northwest, um, Ernie Maiman, wrote The Prize. He, but he had a problem. He wasn't getting the, the, the script on time to uh, Mark Robeson. So what he did is he went over to the studio, you know, uh, to the uni Universal, and he went and looked at North by Northwest very carefully, and he did shot, almost shot by shot, only within the story frame of the prize. Let go of the... The watching a woman be destroyed on camera. And you know who else did this to Jean Seberg, if you can imagine, when she did St. John? You were the book, Otto Preminger. I had a friend who was assistant director on that film, and he said you would not imagine what she went through. It, it, it partially destroyed, destroyed Jean, her. too. Yes. Uh, she was, it, I knew her quite well in LA during the times when she had the, the problem, and she was married to Romain Gary, who was a friend of mine, the Council General from France, who I got to know. And he was a wonderful man, very smart and bright, and he once said to me, this is Jean, now compare, the, you think about the women, and Jean Seberg also had a quality, like Tippi Hedren, this blonde, cool. But she was the burning of the stake should they let the fire burn through the bottom. They wanted realism. And the, he kept it going, and she's now panicked and crying. And, and the, the this AD rushed in and pulled her down, pulled her out from that moment on the, when they were shooting. And I mean, that must have freaked her completely. I'm not sure she ever quite recovered from it. You see, these are moments in our lives, and. I was, I, how can I say, I've been around long enough to be able to have seen and felt some of this. I don't know that we have much of this today because no one is long enough on a film and I mean, I, I haven't seen any of that occur of, of the last 15 years, I don't think we can get years, away with it years. now because women are speaking up. Yeah, and I think that is a good thing. That is a good and thing. And I said today at the luncheon, which I was very thankful of being invited. That was a very nice lunch today with nice people there. And um, I, I said, I can understand one, one thing, that I think women have some part in this. We can't keep uh, be, being so provocative and then say no. You, you draw men in and then you suddenly turn and say no. Now, all, it, all, all we have to do, and I've had many different men in my life that were not, I mean, I won't go into who, but would be seated at a table with their wives in the room, seated at the table, and I found a hand on my knee at a dinner table. And I thought, what a God, this is not, gee. 
And I just lifted the hand and pushed it back onto their lap yeah. and went on with my lunch. And I never had to look and talk further. I could be friendly and nice, but I did not have to be a party to this. I didn't have to accept any. If I, wa if, if I wanted, I would, if someone does, they do. But that's not where I grew up anyway. My grandmother, my parents would have died if I had become part of Hollywood in that sense. That's I hated it. I would not be, get, I just wouldn't let it happen to me. But I must say, you know, it happens and I've witnessed it and I've seen it and felt that push. Helen, well, Melvin Hunt Douglas was like a mentor and Helen, his wife, and she once said to me, you survived Hollywood, Diane. I can't believe that you came out of it whole and you survived. And I said, well, that comes from good family. It goes, comes from parents and your, my grandmother was like, you know. And she, sense of self. And sense, of, sense self. of self. I, I was given that, thank God. I was given that by sense my parents self. and my grandmother. Do we have some questions for Diane? No questions, wow. Well, <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, speak, uh, how did you uh, keep your longevity as far as, you know, like in the beginning, getting parts and, and whatever? How do you credit that where other people don't? You know? How do you credit your longevity? 60 years in the business. Uh, yeah. 60 years. I don't know, I had good I, agent that went out and got the, got the roles. And, and being trustworthy, I think. I think they, people who hired me trusted that I would do what they had, wanted for the parts. It just being, a, a, I was always on time, I never was late. I did my work, I knew my lines. Um, I had good mentors, I had wonderful mentors from Melvin to, uh, uh, even Judith Anderson, who I did The Haunting with uh, at MGM. I'd never worked with a, a Dame Judith Anderson, a great actress doing Medea and all. You know, I got lines sent to me uh, at midnight, or 10 at night, uh, from the network. Whole new lines. That woman, the great actress, offered to cue me at my dressing room, sat on the, on the dressing room step, and gave me, feeding my lines, because she knew I was in trouble. I had to learn them in like a half hour before we started up again, because they were sending, read, I mean, a whole page of new dialogue. I had uh, Lucky, uh, Anne Seymour, another actress, cued me on another set when I was needing help, because I, I had a boyfriend at the time who kept me, he wouldn't <laughs> let me work the night before, it was like he was jealous. And uh, I, I kept saying, I've got to learn and work my lines. And I had one time on the set where I was just showed up and I was, I couldn't remember. And, and that actress came and helped me learn my lines as well. And I had wonderful older friendships, older people who were kind and loving, who really gave me inspiration. Well, poor Diane, because I know you. Diane is not difficult and she is not high maintenance. And people in the business know that, I'm sure. And so you're hireable, because you're- I mean, how did, how did I work on my parts and work, or learn them? No, after you done After shooting. I finished the movie yes. or the show, yes. how did I- How did it take you to get- Oh, work oh, on the uh, you know, it's not hard. You just, you just, oh my God, I will finish with that, but it's done. You stopped. I got done with it. Um, and you rest, and you just take off. There were, uh, oh, I was in India uh, making a film, and um, I flew back 25 hours on a plane, and I had to shoot a film on, at the lot, on the studio lot, and I went from home, barely had one moment to, to unpack, and then I, I started shooting, and I had no time. I was so exhausted that I remember uh, the actor Again, feeding me lines in the makeup chair, and I'm sound asleep. I'm like, and they people help you, uh, friends help you. I've been lucky in my life to have wonderful, good friends. Um, 
Robert Osborne was one dear friend of mine when I took the job to teach and run this school at the university. I said, Robert, what do you think I should do? He said, follow what's in your heart. Follow your gut. Do you want to be in that creative in another way? And I said, I really, really want to do something to help these young people. I want to give back. I want to do this. I feel it in my blood. And he said, then do it. And it doesn't matter if you're earning a lot or a little. If you want to do it, do it. And I, I cherish these people, these friends, my whole life. Because they were seminal. They, they gave me a step along the way. Jerry Lawrence and Robert Lee. I got to know Jerry Lawrence. Um, and they were wonderful, too. Inherit the Wind I got to do with Melvin, who was like my father. Friends with, and their families. I was invited to their home. Uh, I should have been a doctor, actually, because I love helping my friends with medical information. So I love professional people that are doing something to help humanity. No, so Diane, just, you shouldn't have been a doctor. You should have been. No, this is what you have but been. I, I love healing people, healing people, healing <laughs> people with your beliefs and, and your. It's not about medicine. It's about, Norman Cousins was going to use me as an, a sample at UCLA because he was doctor in, uh, in medicine there, and yet he was a publisher. Um, he was going to get several actors in a room and put some kind of uh, feedback machine on, and, and, and we'll have you watch movies, and then measure your excitement and your energy. And he wanted to prove that that uh, he could heal, that laughter was a heal. He wrote the book on, he was the da guy, you may remember, who believed that laughter activated the endorphins and the encephalins in the brain and could heal you. And he was in the hospital with a very bad, he almost died, and he brought Marx Brothers and all the comedies that they showed in his hospital room, and he believed that that he was healed by laughter, and he wanted to prove that if you did after-school programs, and they started testing this at several universities, after-school programs can now almost be proven. If you are in an acting group, or if you act, or if you do plays, if you get yourself in something and you believe in your work and you love it, that after-school programs are what will save young people. We can't let them be pulled away from the school systems. We have to push that. Whether it's Shakespeare or actor, after school acting classes or painting artists, anything that's creative, the creative arts will probably be what saves us, except for things like climate change and very important other things that we have to do for our planet. But we have to keep ourselves happily alive, not miserably alive doing things we love doing. Find out what someone wants to do in their lives and, and encourage them, not to fight them to do it. You can't be a lawyer, a good lawyer, if you don't want to be a good lawyer. But if you want to be a doctor, encourage their child to be a doctor. They want to be work for the city, encourage them to be work for the city. There might be a happy trash collector who wants to clean up things. So that's it. I'm, I'm lecturing. Any, any, uh, I feel like I'm teaching. Questions? When did you know that you wanted to be an actor? I didn't know it because I was very poor in high school. I got a C minus, I think, in acting. But um, it was when I was with the Douglases and in New York, and Melvin and Helen said, "What do you want to do? What are you going to do?" And I, I looked. I thought, "Do I want to be a politician, <coughs> or do I want to act like Melvin?" And I think watching his movies and seeing him work and, and, and having him talk about the actors he worked with, I don't know, it kind of it captured my attention and I took my own money and I took acting classes. My father and mother realized that I was serious and I then eventually, I did go to SC. Uh, I, I pleased them by going to SC because they believed I should have an education in, in university. And then I left to go to the contract box. So what acting wasn't something? No, it wasn't innate in me. I wasn't walking around putting on shows in my 
in my garage. Or, uh, um. Diane, what did you say last night about George Stevens in the acting class? Oh, I didn't say, but I love George Stevens. He was my, the first director. He, Millie and I um, were told we should take acting classes on the, on the set with the teacher that they had at the school, at the studio. And I said no, because I had my own teacher outside. And Millie said no, she didn't want to, but he kind of forced Millie to take, Nina Foch was brought on to work with her, and she was resistant. So I said no, I didn't want to. And Melvin, oh, you remember that? Yeah. Melvin, uh, I mean, uh, George one day on the set said to me, Diana, 